From the Church's Year of Grace by Pius Parsh. You can read more about the Great Feast of the Church by purchasing Beretta Books' reprint of Pius Parsh's The Church's Year of Grace. You can find this and many other fine Catholic books, sacramentals, vestments, and more from BerettaBooks.com. May 4th, St. Monica, Widow. From the Epitaph of Consul Basus. The fame of virtue, greater than praise for deeds, adorns you, fortunate mother of such a son. St. Monica is an example of those holy matrons of the ancient church who proved very influential in their own quiet way. Through prayer and tears she gave the great Augustine to the Church of God, and thereby earned for herself a place of honor in the history of God's kingdom on earth. The Confessions of St. Augustine provide certain biographical details. Born of Christian parents about the year 331 at Tagaste in Africa, Monica was reared under the strict supervision of an elderly nurse who had likewise reared her father. In the course of time, she was given in marriage to a pagan named Patricius. Besides other faults, he possessed a very irascible nature. It was in this school of suffering that Monica learned patience, our virtue for the weak. It was her custom to wait until his anger had cooled. Only then did she give a kindly remonstrance. Evil-minded servants had prejudiced her brother-in-law against her, but Monica mastered the situation by kindness and sympathy. Her marriage was blessed with three children, Navigius Perpetua, who later became a nun, and Augustine, her problem child. According to the custom of the day, baptism was not administered to infants soon after birth. It was as an adolescent that Augustine became a catechumen. But possibly through a premonition of his future sinful life, Monica postponed his baptism, even when her son desired it during a severe illness. When Augustine was 19 years old, his father Patricius died. By patience and prayer, Monica had obtained the conversion of her husband. The youthful Augustine caused his mother untold worry by indulging in every type of sin and dissipation. As a last resort, after all her tears and entreaties had proved fruitless, she forbade him entrance to her home. But after a vision, she received him back again. In her sorrow, a certain bishop consoled her. Don't worry. It is impossible that a son of so many tears should be lost. When Augustine was planning his journey to Rome, Monica wished to accompany him. He outwitted her, however, and had already embarked when she arrived at the docks. Later, she followed him to Milan, ever growing in her attachment to God. St. Ambrose held her in high esteem and congratulated Augustine on having such a mother. At Milan, she prepared the way for her son's conversion. Finally, the moment came when her tears of sorrow changed to tears of joy. Augustine was baptized, and her life work was completed. She died in her 56th year as she was returning to Africa. The description of her death is one of the most beautiful passages in her son's famous confessions. Holy Mass, Cognovi Like a mirror, the Mass reflects the saintly life of this noble woman. Monica served God in holy fear, immaculate in every deed. The oration expressly refers to the tears by which she, as a pious mother, affected the conversion of her son. The Gospel recounts the restoration to life of the son of the widow of Nain. This miracle portrays Augustine's conversion of sinners in every age through the tears of the Holy Mother Church. A widow's function in the Apostolic Church is the Epistle's burden, exemplified, of course, in Monica. The several chant texts are culled from the Church's bridal song, Psalm 44 and remind us of Monica's love for Christ. From the Confessions of St. Augustine, the death of St. Monica. The day on which she was to die came closer and closer. It was a day unknown to us, but you were fully aware of it. I firmly believe that in your inscrutable ways, you had arranged that she and I were alone at the window and looking out into the inner garden of that house on the Tiber at Ostia. Away from the crowds we had retired there, after a long and tiresome journey to renew our strength for the ocean voyage. It was a sweet and pleasant talk we had together in the peaceful and quiet retreat, our thoughts straining forward to what is before, forgetting what is behind. In your presence, you who are truth itself, we would ask each other how wonderful the heavenly life of your saints must be, a life that no earthly eye has as yet seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. We noted that the fleshly pleasures of sense, even when most intense or presented in the most alluring light, cannot be compared to the joys of eternal life. In fact, should not even be mentioned in the same breath. Then with fervor growing ever more intense, our souls soared up to the eternal. 
and we continued speaking. Lord, you know well what we said that day, and how during the conversation the world and all its pleasures dwindled into nothingness. Then my mother said, My son, speaking of myself, nothing earthly delights me any longer. I do not know why I am still here, or why I should remain here. I have no further earthly desires. There had been one thing for which I had wanted to remain a little while in this world, to see you a Christian and a Catholic before I died. God has granted my wish fully, since I now see that you are his servant, one who despises all earthly goods. Why then do I remain on earth? How I answered I do not know, but soon after perhaps less than five days she was stricken by a fever. One day during her illness she temporarily lost consciousness. We hastened to her bedside. Soon, however, she became normal again, and upon seeing us, my brother and me, standing at her bedside, she said inquiringly, What has happened? And when she realized that we were wholly upset with grief, she said, Here you will bury your mother. In silence I struggled against tears. My brother replied to the effect that he would prefer her to die at home rather than in a foreign land. When she heard this, she punished him by an anguished look for having thought such things. Then she looked to me and said, Did you hear what he said? And then she enjoined on both of us, Bury this body wherever it may be, and do not let it bother you further. The one thing that I do ask of you is a memento at the altar of the Lord and that wherever you happen to be. When she had said this as best she could, she became silent, and her sickness grew worse. But I could not forget how often and with what exan- but I could not forget how often and with what anxiety she had made preparations to be interred beside her husband. It was on the ninth day of her illness, when she was fifty five years old and I was thirty three, that the pure and holy soul of my mother was released from her body. I pressed her eyelids together. Then my heart was overwhelmed by grief, and it welled up in tears. Only my resolute determination restrained them, and my eyes remained dry, and my inner impulses to weep aloud like a child were likewise hushed, for we realized that it was unbecoming to surround this death with loud cries and tearful moaning, as is done at the death of evil men, who have gone down to eternal death. Her death was not an unhappy one, nor did she forfeit life everlasting. And when she was buried, I accompanied that body, and I returned without shedding a tear. Nor did I weep during the prayers offered up to you, as the holy sacrifice of our redemption was offered for her soul. Even though, as is customary there, the body lay uninterred alongside the grave. But within the depths of my soul, I suffered intensely throughout the day. And in my confused state of mind, I besought you, as best I could, to heal my sorrows. But you did not do it. Because by this one instance you perhaps intended to show me how even the soul that already nourishes itself on the word, that never deceives, may yet be opposed by the tyranny of habit and affection.